street artists that convene there and do drawing uh, charcoal, that's the, that's the element, charcoal por portraits of individuals who pay them a good fee to do so, right? So I'm reading the guide and I'm like, yo, I'm in Saragossa, Spain for the Fiesta del Pilar and uh, these street artists are here. I think I'm going to go ahead, uh, pony up the money, pay this ex very expensive price and see if some dude can do me. No, I'm talking about really do me in a way that actually looks like me. I mean, all people were talking about is that at this festival, they will draw you in a way that is so starkly like you, it will look more like a photograph than a drawing. So I'm like, I'm down. I want someone to capture all of my handsomeness so I can put it on a wall somewhere and say, some dude drew this of me, right? So I sit down in the chair. Now, it's very interesting because at the Festival del Pilar, when you sit down in the chair, because these artists are so well-renowned and spoken of, you're sitting something like this. The artist is, is there, and they're painting you, right? And the crowd gathers around your painting. So I thought that people gathered around based on how great it was. Because not everybody was gathered around everyone. But let me tell you, my portrait garnered a crowd. No, you guys are laughing like I'm playing. This is a true story. Man, people started coming in and watching this dude, and before you know it, I kid you not, this is not an exaggeration. It is not preacher's hyperbole on display. Man, there was about 35 people just all gathered around my portrait. And they would look at me and then look at the painting and look at me, and then some people would say, wow. The Spaniards would say, que guay, Right? So I'm just taking it in. I'm like, dang, I thought I was handsome. But now I know I'm handsome, dadgummit. Y'all people staring at this thing, man. I'm like, man, this was worth it. All these euros that I had to turn over to this guy to draw me. And now I'm going to be one of those portraits that make it somewhere in the Louvre Museum. I don't know by whose painting, but it's going to be there because that thing is just so awe-inspiring and moving, right? And so then he kind of sets back. He puts down the pencil and the eraser, and I can tell he's finished. And I just can't wait. I'm sitting here, man, I'm standing up. I'm bowing to the crowd like, yo, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it, yo, call me, yo, hit me up, hit me up. You know, and then he turns it around, right? He turns it around. Right? So I'm looking at the joint, right? And I'm like, yeah, where, where's my portrait, though? <laughs> like, y'all over th here thinking this thing is tight. I want to know where my portrait's at. I've been sitting here for like 45 minutes, right? So I'm looking at the joint, right? And he's like, in his broken English, because he knows my American, I'm about to argue with him in broken Spanish, right? And so I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, no, nah, brother, I want, I want you to do that again. Because I don't look like that. The man I see is way more handsome than that man. I don't know who this is. This looks like an evil twin or something like that. This ain't me, though. I need my money back, brother, or you need to do this again. So we keep going back and forth, and now it's getting heated. And you know, Americans, when we're overseas and we get mad and stuff, we always got to drop in the embassy, right? So I'm like, bro, I will call the embassy on you, son. Yo, it's right around the corner, homie. Don't make me go to the embassy. You know who my president is. He will bomb you and your family. You better get me the right painting. We go back and forth, right? My friends who have sat at other street artists now have finished and they have their paintings as well, their drawings, excuse me, and they walk over and they're like, yo, Mike, what is the problem? So the problem is this don't look like me. They're like, dude, it looks just like you. What are you talking about? Stop giving this dude such a hard time. I said, are you serious? They said, Mike. This looks just like you. He did a great job. He even captured your do-rag and everything. So I'm taking my painting, salty than a mug, back to the hotel, right? And I just stare at it. 
it's looking at me and I'm looking at it. And I'm like, man, do you really look like that? Okay, after staring for about 55 minutes, yes, it's narcissistic, I know, right? God was still working on me, staring at my portrait for 55 minutes, an idea hit me that revolutionized my life. Maybe the way I think I look is not the way I really look. I had never thought about this before. If you had have ever asked somebody to come to me and say, who is the expert on how you look? I would have said, I'm the expert. And I would have justified it by the fact that I look in a mirror at myself every single day. But how many of you know that if you were to count the hours that you spent in front of the mirror and actually count the hours that someone spends looking at you as you walk around during the day, people are more experts on what you look like than you are. It changed my life to realize and recognize that what I thought I looked like, no one else thought I looked like that. But when a dude sat down from a third-person objective perspective and drew me, all of my friends said, no, that's exactly what you look like. And I'm sitting here challenged because what Peter thinks he looks like in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, is exactly what others think he looks like. He's standing there preaching to haters, notice, preaching to haters about who he's affiliated with. And if you go back to the text, Acts 4 and 13 says, hey, these guys looked at him were like, man, they're untrained, they're uneducated, man, they're super bold. Wait a second. They've been with Jesus. I can tell that they have been with Jesus. These individuals from the outside agree with what Peter says he looks like. And I'm saying, oh my goodness, if other people are the experts on what we look like, then maybe other people's opinion about what you look like is closer to the truth than what you think you look like. Could it be that when our generation goes out to the world and we say, we are Christians, do other people agree that you look like you've been with Jesus? I am mind blown by the fact that he can go to people that don't even like him. I mean, if, if I was them and I really wanted to get under his skin, I would have said, yo, bro, you kind of look like uh, Herod. No, Peter, you know who you really look like? Pilate. I would have really gotten under his skin and moved him towards uh, being more similar to someone I know he doesn't like. But why is it that these individuals who want to put Peter to death end up concluding that he actually looks like what he preaches about? He actually looks like what he says he's here to represent. Peter looks like he's been with Jesus. What would happen if the young adults in North America looked like they been with Jesus? No, what would it look like if people could tell? See, the issue in so many of our lives is we do champion a walk with Christ, but nobody can tell. Nobody can tell. When we start preaching about Christ, their response is not, you look like you've been with Jesus. It may instead say, you look like you've been with Sandy. You look like you have been with my man over here, Samuel. They start saying we resemble the individuals in our circles, in our environments, in our communities, in our cities. But they don't seem to jump straight to you look like you've been with Jesus. If we want to talk about integrity, I want to throw out a brand new definition of integrity. Integrity is simply this. Integrity is when you claim to be a follower of Jesus and people can tell. 
That's a brand new definition. And please, it's by Michael Anthony Polite because I want people to know where it came from. I believe that now in this 2015 school year, God is wanting some individuals to redefine integrity, not based on some West Webster's definition, but instead based on someone's just wholehearted, throwing themselves out there, gutsy move to be a follower of Jesus Christ at all times. Because if people who hate your guts have to stand back and still proclaim that you look like you've been with Jesus, how powerful of a witness that is. I thought that was the revelation of the story. But it is nothing compared to what some English majors may recognize faster than others. I want to bless some people from the humanities division and just say, guys, learning the power of punctuation marks is key to receiving revelation in the Bible of God. I mean, it is just paramount to learn the power of punctuation marks. If you read all of Acts chapter 4, do you recognize and notice that Peter is actually being tried at the same location that Jesus was tried at? Oh, man, hang in there with me. He's being tried at the same place where he denied Jesus Christ. His story is coming full circle in about 90 days. Now watch this. If you also look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say that the last time Peter was here, he was following Jesus at a distance. No, read it all for yourself. If you watch each of them talk about where was Peter at the trial of Christ, they will say he was following him at a distance. And what that ends up a consequently yielding is that when he gets to the courtyard, according to John chapter 18, people talk about his affiliation with Jesus with question marks. Are you a follower of Jesus? No, nah, you got the wrong brother. You got the wrong brother. I don't know the man. Aren't you one of his disciples? No, 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 that's not me. I'm telling you, you got the wrong person. No, 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 no. Weren't you in the Garden of Gethsemane? This is John 18. And to each of those things, he says, no, I never knew the man. Cock crows twice. He goes into weeping because he recognizes that his integrity is damaged. That all that talk he was doing about getting Christ back and being a follower of Jesus just went out the door. Because when the chips hit the table, he went ahead and went to the default of being a coward. He was following Jesus at a distance, and the only thing people had to say about him and his affiliation with Jesus was always in question marks. Now, watch what happens the next time he comes to the same place. Do you recognize that they say, it is obvious this man has been with Jesus, period. No question marks. The last time he was at this building being questioned about Jesus, there were question marks everywhere about his affiliation and his integrity. But something happens between that first trip to the courthouse and that second trip to the courthouse where all the question marks are now periods. Now, what would it be like to have an integrity where people have no question about your affiliation? They have no question about who you serve. Every time they talk about you, it's always they are a follower of Jesus, period. Like, yo, with this dude, you think he'll come and watch this movie with us? Nah. Why not? Because he's a follower of Jesus, period. Yo, will she come to the party with us tonight? Nah. Why not? Because she's a follower of Jesus, period. Yo, will he end up getting two or three chicks this semester? No, nah, that's not him. Why? Because he's a follower of Jesus, period. Yo, what's up? Hey, is she going to be down? No, nah, she's not down with that type of stuff. Why? Because she's a follower of Jesus, period. I am personally tired of looking in the mirror and thinking about my relationship with Jesus Christ and seeing question marks. I'm just tired of it. 
guys, yo, I'm a preacher, right? I'm the last person who should probably be saying this in the room right now, but I'm just trying to be transparent. Yo, my integrity is damaged just like your integrity. And the thing that's driving me crazy is I want my story to end with periods, not question marks. I want even the people that hate me to have to conclude this dude has been with Jesus, period. Our generation has become comfortable with describing our relationship with Jesus Christ with question marks. And as soon as someone tries to call us out about it, we go to the default of cowardice, which in our context is don't judge me. Don't act like you're holier than I am. And we try to keep people from pointing out question marks by trying to point out their question marks. But yo, real talk, there were a lot of people all around Peter who had issues too. But it's very interesting that by the time he comes back to the courthouse, their punctuation marks have changed. It is not enough for you to simply fight off people and what they see by trying to call them out for their lack of integrity. Because maybe someone else and their view of your integrity could be closer to the truth than your own view of yourself. Because I believe when people follow Jesus, other people can tell. As a musician comes to play, I am trying to figure out in my mind, okay, Peter had broken integrity at the first time to the courthouse, restored integrity at the second time at the courthouse. What happens in between those two trips that could possibly have the power to just transform this dude's life in a matter of less than three months? What is it that happened to him that renewed his courage and his willingness to push forward and allow the world to see a Jesus in him with boldness and with no apology. What is it that happened in his life that transformed him by the renewing of his mind? Why is it that the question marks turned into periods? I believe one defining act changed his life and it was the death of Jesus that's the only thing that happens in between the two and it's not just the death of Jesus but the resurrection of Jesus and I love how when Jesus comes back from the dead he sends a personal message to one disciple he tells Mary Magdalene yo I need you to go tell Peter, what you have seen. Why Peter? Because I think Jesus the whole time, all three and a half years, planned to do some amazing work inside of Peter to take all of the sandiness of his Christian walk out and replace it with the rock of salvation. And that's why he prophesied over his life, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church upon the bedrock of the fact that Jesus can change someone's integrity. He can take out the wishy-washy stuff and replace it with solid, good righteousness. I don't want us to take part in taking these symbols into our bodies just because that's kind of what we do in church. But I want us to renew our understanding of this ordinance. Every time you take part in communion, I want you to remember, Christ is trying to change my question marks into periods. He's trying to change my wishy-washy walk into one that is steadfast and unmovable. He's trying to take out all the cowardice, and replace it with boldness. And I believe if our generation accepts that word, we will experience 
the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the evangelizing of our entire world like no one has ever seen on this planet. God's just waiting for us to allow those question marks to turn into periods. The praise team is going to lead us in further reflection as we continue to just take in the fact that Jesus has the power to transform our lives. He has the power to give us a new life that we might have life abundantly.